From birthing one of the world's largest religions to setting the foundation for modern democracies, the power of some of these indigenous tribes can still be felt today. The pagan Lithuanian tribes had already been coming together in the early 13th century to resist German crusader encroachment, who, according to researchers from the University of Reading, had subjugated coastal Latvia and Estonia. According to Christina Markman of UCLA, a group of Lithuanian nobles signed a 1219 treaty that began the unification of the state. By 1253, the Lithuanian duke Mindogas embraced Catholicism, hoping that papal recognition would halt crusader attacks on his lands. Mindogas was killed in 1263 and his country reverted to paganism, but Lithuania Lithuania's power did not wane. In fact, according to Russia Beyond, the pagan Grand Dukes of Lithuania only grew stronger, adding Ukraine and Belarus to their domains in the 14th century. Lithuania's strength attracted potential allies, if only its rulers could be converted to Catholicism. Columbia University says that it was in 1386 that Poland was seeking a husband for its monarch, Jadwiga, while the Lithuanian Duke Jogaila needed a wife. The marriage created both a Catholic Lithuania and a united Polish-Lithuanian army to crush the German Teutonic Order which was intruding on Lithuanian lands from its Baltic domains. At the 1410 Battle of Tannenberg, the Polish-Lithuanian army crushed the Crusaders, making Poland-Lithuania the foremost power in the region. Eventually, the two countries united into the Commonwealth, a superstate that dominated Renaissance Eastern Europe and saw the flowering of Polish art, literature, and science. Pretty good for its humble origins. The Mexica tribe, also known as the Aztecs, was not indigenous to Mexico. According to archaeologist Nicoleta Maestri, the Mexica were said to have migrated from the mythical island of Aslan, along with six fellow tribes. According to Deseret News, it's believed that Aslan was probably located somewhere in what's now the western part of the United States, with some suggestions narrowing it down to the Rocky Mountains. According to Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, the Mexica left Aztlan on orders from the sun god Huitzilopochtli on a journey that in Spanish translates as the pilgrimage. The legend says that upon seeing an eagle perched on a cactus, the migrants stopped. There on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco, they built a city called Tenochtitlan as their capital. The Mexica soon imposed themselves in their new homeland. According to the Essential Codex Mendoza, a string of rulers expanded the state as far as Central America and created the Aztec Empire. As Spanish conquistador Benel Díaz del Castillo noted in his memoirs, this empire was extremely rich capital more populous than many European cities, and unmatched in its military might, but it fell as swiftly as it had risen in the face of old world disease and technology. Although the Mexica were assimilated into New Spain, their language survives, as does their name, preserved in the modern country of Mexico. According to Texas Public Radio, the movie The Searchers is based on the true story of the search for nine-year-old Cynthia Ann Parker, who was kidnapped during a Comanche raid on the Texas frontier. The hatred between the Comanches and American settlers is highlighted when Texas Ranger Patrick Wayne shoots a dead Comanche's eyes out to deny him an afterlife. First I prayed to you. Come and get me. Take me home. You didn't come. Wayne's actions illustrates a historical enmity between the Comanche and American settlers, and the consequences of that conflict played out countless times across the West. The Comanche were one of the Great Plains' most powerful tribes, feared and respected for their horsemanship, ferocity, and willingness to resist American encroachment. One particular tribe, which Spanish chronicles refer to as the Quahades, resisted the U.S. government to the bitter end. They refused negotiation or trade with Americans, Mexicans, other Europeans, or even other tribes, preferring to raid them instead. In 1871, an alliance of Americans and Tonkawa natives decided to end the Quahadis once and for all. Chief Quana Parker, son of a Comanche chief and the aforementioned Cynthia Ann Parker, was ready for them. As the American cavalry set out, the Comanches engineered panic among their horses while the men were at rest, capturing 70 of them in confusion. According to the Texas Historical Commission, the U.S. Army drove the Comanche away from their food sources and killed the horses and buffalo they depended on. In 1875, Parker and his holdouts accepted reservation land in Indian Territory, and the Comanche resistance ended. Altogether, the Comanche had held out for over 40 years. The Amhara are not a single tribe per se, but a ethno-linguistic group consisting of many tribes that dominate northern and central Ethiopia. According to Atlas of Humanity, these tribes built the core of Ethiopia with some of the best dynastic credentials and treasure to back up their claims to fame. The Amhara people dominated the Ethiopian elite per Britannica, providing the country with all of its rulers except one from 1270 onward, but there was another claim to fame. According to the Horniman Museum, Ethiopia's ruling dynasty traced its lineage from Israel 
Israel's King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba through their son Menelik. Solomon eventually set Menelik to establish the worship of the one true god in Ethiopia, and he became the scion of the Solomonic dynasty. As if the blood of Solomon wasn't enough, the Amhara rulers had another treasure to boost their Israelite pedigrees. According to the story, they were designated to be the keepers of one of the most famous relics of Christianity. It's said that this piece isn't lost at all, and we know right where it is. Aksum, Ethiopia, the Church of St. Mary of Zion. According to Smithsonian Magazine, the Ark of the Covenant ended up in Ethiopia in the 6th century BC, where it is claimed to still be today, in Aksum's Church of Our Lady at Mount Zion. Thus, these Amhara Christian rulers, with the blood of Israel's legendary kings running through their veins and in possession of the most valuable artifact in the Abrahamic world, could claim a spiritual authority that made them a truly unique and one might say legendary group of people. Still, seeing the Ark? The Relic's Guardians say that's not going to happen anytime soon. We have top men working on it right now. Who? According to the Perseus Digital Library, the name Osturas refers to tribal groups that lived in the mountains of northern Iberia. Although they came under Roman rule, these fiercely independent mountaineers survived to fight another day. In the 8th century, they planted the first seeds of the country today known as Spain. When Tariq ibn Zihad conquered the Visigothic Kingdom of Iberia for Islam, he overcame heavily fortified cities and a powerful Visigoth army. By the time he reached northern Iberia, the hardest part of the conquest seemed behind him. According to the Chronicle of Alfonso III, Tariq left a governor named Munuza to administer the region's fractious tribes, believing them incapable of meaningfully resisting. Tariq and Munuza, however, could not have been more wrong, because that's when a Visigoth noble and warlord named Don Paleo recruited a handful of warriors from among the Osteres and rose against Muslim rule. In 718 or 722, depending on the telling, this force defeated the Muslims at Covadonga. The Osteres proclaimed Peleo their king, establishing a bulwark against Islamic expansion that kept Iberian Christianity alive and eventually pushed the conquerors out of the peninsula. The Osteres gradually disappeared as tribal boundaries dissolved, but their legacy lives on in the Spanish saying, Osteres is Spain, the rest is conquered land. The term Nubian, says the economist, refers to the indigenous inhabitants of northern and central Sudan and southern Egypt, whose history goes back as far as Ifarianic times. While Nubians today are mostly Muslim, these tribes once created rich, thriving Christian kingdoms in medieval Sudan. According to the military history of late Rome, the inhabitants of Nubia beyond the borders of Roman Egypt began to coalesce into a series of tribal confederacies in the late antique period. The resulting Christian kingdoms of Novatia, Mercuria, and Elodia adopted a system in which a high king ruled over lesser rulers, presumably rulers whose power was based on kinship ties within a tribal setting. The most interesting facet of medieval Nubia was its Christian religion. According to Dr. Vince Bantu, Nubia was evangelized from Coptic Egypt and had tense relations with the Christian patriarchs of Rome and Constantinople due to theological disagreements. Unlike Egypt, however, the Nubian kingdom successfully resisted Arab invasion. In subsequent negotiations, Nubia accepted Muslim rule in Egypt in return for Muslim recognition of Nubia's Christianity. Christianity. The Nubian kingdoms eventually came under Islamic rule, but ancient ruins, like that of a monastery discovered at Al Ghazali, Sudan, remain as reminders of the area's Christian past. The Quraysh tribe is one of history's most important. According to PBS, tribal identity based on close kinship ties was the basis of relations in pre-Islamic Arabia. The Quraysh tribe was among the most influential thanks to its control of the city of Mecca. According to the International Journal of Middle East Studies, Mecca was a commercial and religious hub that drew pilgrims to its principal shrine, the Kaaba, even before the advent of Islam. The Quraysh had outmuscled their rivals for control of the town and were firmly situated there by 570, when the tribe's most famous member, the Islamic prophet, Muhammad was born. Muhammad belonged to the Banu Hashim clan of the Quraysh, from whom the Jordanian royal family today claims descent. Driven by the new faith of Islam, Muhammad and his followers united the fractious tribes of the Arabian Peninsula through a mix of diplomacy and force. Following his death, Muhammad's successors, as UNESCO notes, turned their attention to conquests outside of Arabia, seizing everything from Iberia to Pakistan in a matter of decades. The Quraysh would continue to dominate the Islamic world for centuries to follow. Today, the Pew Research Center says that over 1.8 billion people follow the teachings of its most famous member. 
The phrase indigenous tribes might conjure up images of hunter-gatherers living traditional lifestyles on the fringes of modern societies, but Etymology Online says that the word tribe originally described political divisions within the Roman Republic. It follows, then, that as surprising as it may seem, one of the most powerful and influential tribes is none other than the Romans. According to the University of Chicago, the Etruscan king of Rome, Servius Tullius, divided the people of Rome into 30 tribes that were arranged topographically. That later expanded into 35 tribes, and these units of eventually formed the basis for the Roman Republic's voting system that, in turn, helped elect the officials that turned Rome into a Mediterranean empire. The voting tribes of Rome had a variety of functions, most importantly levying soldiers for the army and collecting taxes or tributes from their members. But tribes also had the right to elect officials. And what have they ever given us in return? The aqueduct? What? According to the Roman constitution, the Comitia Tributa met to elect the lower magistrates, while the common or plebeian members of the tribe met separately to elect their own representatives, independent of Rome's wealthy patrician families. But as tribes tend to do, they opposed and fought each other for power. Political affiliation today has become a group identity for many. Such was the case even in the Roman Republic 2,000 plus years ago. According to Livy's History of Rome, a tribune named Marcus Flavius called for the rebel Tusculani people to be severely punished for their disloyalty. All the tribes but one, the Palia, vetoed this proposition. The Tusculani eventually joined the Roman Papiri tribe, bringing their grudges against the Polia with them. Thus, as Livy notes, the political climate between the two tribes became one of outright hostility, as no member of either tribe ever voted for a candidate of the other for centuries after. Regardless of the story's veracity, there are other instances that show friction did occur, making the tribe's early versions of modern political parties.